He may be a precinct worker or president. He may give his talents at the courthouse, the state house, the White House. He may be a civil servant or a senator, a candidate or a campaign worker, a winner or a loser. But he must be a participant and not a spectator. Hi, uh, Senator, Mr. Mayor, good to be with both of you. Uh, we're coming to you from Charlotte, of course, and of course it's a big banking uh, community. I know the Senator will have a lot to say about this, but the Mayor can respond to my questions about gentrification, specifically in a community like this, and how uh, in a banking town uh, we can make sure that the poor aren't left out and marginalized any more than they already are. Well, it, I, I always use, because everyone saw it on television, I use New Orleans as the, as the easiest example to relate to. You know, what I think a lot of people in the country saw the aftermath of the hurricane in New Orleans, and uh, they said, well, how, you know, I had no idea poverty was this bad, and how could something like that happen? And of course, what was happening in New Orleans was what's happened in communities all over the country. Basically, you have affluent whites uh, who either send their kids to private school or they or they move out to the suburbs. You have uh, poor people clustered together, and the most obvious example was in the Ninth Ward of New Orleans. The truth is that what we saw in New Orleans is true in urban areas all over this country. It's exactly what's happened uh, in America. And and the question is, I said earlier, um, because I do believe it deeply, that everybody has equal worth. Well, if everybody has equal worth, we ought to be willing to actually live together. And that means we shouldn't have poor black people clustered in one part of the city and affluent whites in another. It is not good. It's not healthy. It's not healthy for either group. Um, we need both economic and racial uh, integration of cities and neighborhoods. Uh, it's good for everybody involved. And and to, in order to give these people who are struggling the kind of chance that they need, and I might add, I've now been in probably 30 to 35 states over the last nine months meeting with families who live in poverty, no press, no media, just me and them. And they violate every stereotype that's out there. You know, they're lazy and no account and irresponsible. The first thing is if you go to a place that's helping people who are struggling, mostly what you see is women. And most of them are single mothers. They love their kids more than they love themselves. And they would do anything for their children. They are working two or three jobs, 16 hours a day, six or seven days a week, all so that their kids can have a better life. Now these are the kind of people that we should embrace. But they, they need a chance and they're faced with such hurdles because it's happened with those people in New Orleans. They, you know, why did the poor get hurt the worst by the hurricane? Because they always get hurt the worst. I mean, they live on the edge of a razor every day. And the way I always ask people to think about this, you know, something bad happens to all of us. All of us. In my case, your wife gets sick. Uh, she's actually doing great now, but, but you know, your wife gets sick or your child gets sick and uh, you run into some financial problem you don't expect. Pa bad things happen to all of us. Here's the difference. If you're poor, and if you're like those folks living in the Ninth Ward of New Orleans, when something bad happens, you're in a ditch. And you can't get out because there's nothing to get you out. You know, people will say to me, I had, right after the hurricane, people say, why didn't these folks leave, you know? There were warnings. They were told to leave. They didn't leave, of course, because they couldn't leave. They didn't have a car. They didn't have a bank account. They didn't have a credit card. They didn't have any way to leave. They had no way to take care of themselves if they had left. So these are the struggles that these folks face every single day. And the vast majority of them work. They're good people. They're trying to do what's right, and they just need a chance. I think there are a lot of things to be done. I don't want to spend all this discussion on that. You know, we need to do something to, I think we ought to raise the minimum wage in the country so that people who are working for minimum wage can earn a decent standard of living. Uh, I think <laughs> health care system is in crisis in America. You know, we can't continue to do this. You know, people can't pay for their health care. Millions of people, 46 million now, don't have health care covered. Uh, we have to address the health care problem. These folks who don't have any assets, don't have bank accounts, et cetera, don't have anything to fall back on, we need to help them create assets, help them help themselves. I don't mean just give them stuff. 
I'm talking about us helping them when they help themselves. Uh, access to decent housing. There's a whole group of things that we need to do. Uh, but the starting place is to convince the country that this is a huge moral cause in our country. I saw this publication overseas after the hurricane hit, and it had pictures of the victims of, in New Orleans. And it said the headline was, this is what the world is saying, by the way. The headline was, The Shaming of America. The world is watching now to see, now that we've seen, that people can't claim anymore we don't know what's going on. The world is watching to see what we're going to do about it. I mean, are we actually going to step to the plate and give these people a chance to help themselves? Or are we just going to continue doing what we've been doing? You know, that, the, that question is with us. And I might add, this is, this is an issue. If I could convince young people to make this the cause of your generation, I would feel like I've done something great with my life. If I did nothing else but that, I would be happy. Because these folks have never had, I can tell you from sitting in rooms with them or hour after hour after hour, they have never had a champion. They have no idea what it's like to have somebody stand up for them. They scrape and fight and hang on by their fingernails just to survive every single day. They're worried about their kids eating. It's not right. It's not right, and you can do something about it. I agree with John that there are, are two Americas in this country, but I, I would, we would diverge on some of the root causes for that. There is an income divide in America, if you will, but the bigger and more stark divide is education. Um, a vast majority of people living in poverty didn't finish high school. Uh, people who at least finished high school in this America have a fighting chance to, to join the American dream. If they don't, the statistics are very bleak and gloomy. Imprisonment, poverty, homelessness. Um, you, you young people in this room, and some of you a little older than young that were a couple raise their heads when you're in the mid-30s, your destiny is not entirely in your hands. You could pull out of here on... On, on 401 and get hit by a semi participating in the twice daily Fuquay 500. But the best way to control your own destiny is to prepare yourself, to get educated. Uh, minority families in the United States who have the e equal educational level of white families earn at or above the level of white families. If, if we can just make sure everyone is focused on the importance of getting a good education, uh, when I was mayor of Raleigh, and we had some horrible problems in public housing. Um, crime, uh, when the kids got home from school in the afternoons, uh, the mothers would whisk them right from the bus into the, into the apartment and shut the door and draw the blinds, and those kids didn't come out again. And this was at an easy walking distance of the mayor's office. Pizza delivery trucks wouldn't go in there after dark. And so we put police substations in these public housing neighborhoods to create a perimeter of safety so that some level of civilized society could be conducted there. And when we ran the criminals off, the other underlying pathologies affecting those neighborhoods bubbled up where we could see them. Here was the most disturbing. Seven out of every ten children in public housing were dropping out before they finished high school. Seventy percent. That number right there in the 2,000 families in public housing accounted for almost the entire dropout rate in Wake County. And so we went in and interviewed 1,500 families in public housing to find out why we were losing these kids. And here's what we found out by accident. The three out of 10 that were finishing high school could almost invariably identify outside their immediate family a caring adult mentor, a coach, a teacher, a pastor, somebody who got involved enough in their lives to make sure they finished high school. And out of that, we started community learning centers where we, we put computer labs in the public housing neighborhoods so that these kids would have some place to go after school to continue their education. If you want to make a difference in this world, if you want to affect the poverty that he talks about, take some time and go find some teenager in Wake County, and there's 12 municipalities here and a whole bunch of schools, and confront that teenager and make sure they get through high school. If you do that one thing, 
you will be doing more for your, for your country and your community and poverty than just about anything else we can do. And, and I want to close with this because we talked about the differences between the parties. The most dangerous trend in America to me today is the principles of limited government that Thomas Jefferson wrote about and Alexander Hamilton wrote about and the Founding Fathers wrote into the Constitution. Those principles of limited government are no longer in vogue in this country today and they are reflected in no coherent way by either political party. And that has to be addressed and that is an issue of education. Find out why this country was founded and how it was founded and the principles its government was based on and it will open up a new world for you about how to translate and transcend political rhetoric and figure out for yourself what's the best path for this country to take and how you can get involved in leading us down that path.